I'm going to leave, but I'll be right back. That sounds good. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. We are so excited. So um, while everybody was in the waiting room, um, we were catching uh, Mr. Uh, William Kent Kruger up on all of the things that we've been doing today. Um, and he was uh, very excited to hear about our uh, Minnesota charcuterie experience, but he was very excited to hear about last night's event with Hawk Horvath, which um, I'm, I'm still <laughs> kind of amazed by that. And uh, I don't know about anybody else who was in last night's session. Um, I had a hard time falling asleep last night and I'd like to say that I don't believe in ghosts, but um, I definitely found myself thinking about that uh, that motorcycle story that I think it was Nancy Brubaker had asked about. Oh man, and it didn't help. I have cats. I have two cats. You guys have not met them yet because I've kept my door closed. But um, one of them likes to jump up in the window ledge. And I couldn't tell if he was wheezing because he's a 13 pound fat cat or if he was hissing at something outside. But I'm like, I wonder what Hawk would think about this. And uh, it kind of freaked myself out a little bit, but it's all good now. So. And then she was saying so many things about that they look to disprove their photos or their evidence. So they're not like, they don't say, oh, it's gotta be. So anyway, it was a little freaky. I had a little bit of tr trouble going to sleep too, so. If anybody I wants to like, friendly, you know, I, I slept like a baby. Oh. <laughs> How much Akavid did you have, my friend? Well, we won't talk about how much Akavid I had before that. <laughs> Norwegian sleeping medicine. <laughs> you it's know not, it. It's not. Somebody said it was for digestion, but I don't know if I believe it. I think it was for sleep. Multi-purpose, I think. All right. Well, everyone, it is 5.30, but we're going to just give people a few more moments. Um, we're about at 47 participants right now. I know we're gonna have a few more coming in. So in the meantime, what I'm gonna end up doing, if you guys can see my screen, uh, welcome to Wit, Wisdom and Wine. We are so excited to have you here tonight. Um, and just make sure to have your microphone on mute. If you have questions for Mr. Kruger, please go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, uh, Kent has a talk for us that he's gonna give and it has, you know, um, you know he has a, you know, a, a thread that he wants to go through. And um, so we're going to we're going to hold questions until the end. So just go ahead, know that your questions are seen by uh, Brenda, myself, or Catherine, or Grace. But we'll be taking those at the end. Uh, oh, Grace, I can't see your screen. Well, that has nothing to do with the wine I was just drinking. I swear. <laughs> and oh shoot, my mother-in-law is in the session. Sorry, Gloria. Oh well, she's not surprised. I'm from Iowa. Um, so anyway, so. Uh, Make sure to meet your, mute, mute your microphone, please, to join us in chat. Click that chat icon. If, you know, again, Zoom is strange. Um, I feel like I'm talking to a computer screen because I am, but go ahead and throw um, a reaction in. If you hear something that you like to hear, just yay, clapping hearts. Thank you guys, I feel seen. Um, consider using the speaker view. So your current speaker is highlighted for you. Unfortunately, right now in your case, that's me. Pretty soon it'll be Mr. Kruger. And then finally, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, go ahead and ping us in the chat. Um, hopefully between the four of us, we'll be able to troubleshoot what's going on. How are we doing, Brenda, for attendance right now? Pardon, go ahead and start. Uh, you know, before we start, Erlene just popped a question in. How many people did we have in the cheese tasting? Was it 35? I was gonna look it up after. <laughs> So we were so befuddled by the deliciousness that we totally, I think it was like about 35 and oh, that was delicious. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, oh, I see more chats going on here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share because I know Brenda, will you please introduce yourself and roll video? Hi, I am uh, Brenda Cardock. I am the executive director of the Rochester Public Library Foundation, but you didn't come here today to hear me. So we're gonna roll just a short video and then we will get right to the presentation because I know you all want to hear William Kent Kruger. So I'm just gonna share my screen, which I've practiced quite a bit. And now I just have to move it up and press play. 
Rochester Public Library Foundation was formed in 1996 in an effort to raise private funds for the library and ensure its continued success and achievements. The foundation supports initiatives, often creating the only opportunity for pilot projects and incentives for community feedback. In past years, we have helped launch the Wi-Fi hotspot program, providing connectivity in homes that have no internet. Rochester Reading Champions, which pairs tutors with struggling readers to achieve results. And last year, patrons joined in the commitment to help the library go fine free, to help remove barriers to accessing the library's resources. We are proud of the positive impact these programs have had on our community. Tutors remark on the joy it brings them to see the confidence and pride on their students' faces as they master skills they had all but given up on. Our neighbors are able to apply for jobs and video chat with relatives as they keep social distance in their homes using our hotspots. Materials are being checked out in large quantities and picked up through touchless delivery in the Mayo Civic Center ramp and the library's newly installed walk-up windows. But we still do not have all the resources we need to help all those who could benefit from tutoring. The hotspots continue to have a wait list. And we continue to investigate ways we can grow our service to our community, especially as we are facing greater challenges this year than ever before. Thank you for supporting the library and foundation. The kindness of people like you means so much and allows our community to flourish. Thank you for sharing our belief in the importance of information, books, materials, and resources. Giving everyone equal access to learn, grow, and thrive is at the center of everything we do. If you would like to pitch in to help us in our efforts, please go to our website. And thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, we have had such a great opportunity today to learn about not only what the foundation does for uh, the people of this community, but also we had we started off uh, this morning's uh, wit, wisdom, and wine. I have to check and make sure I'm not getting that in the wrong order. But we uh, started off today with Audrey Betcher, who is our library's director, and. Um, you know, I feel like I know a lot about the library through the volunteering that I've done and just being a patron of the library, but um, you guys, uh, the librarians, uh, the staffers, the volunteers, we have such a great community library and, um, and it's just the kind, of, uh, the kind of program that I'm proud to be associated with. And, um, and it's the kind of place that gives authors like Kent Kruger an opportunity to get words out into the uh, world. So I'm going to introduce uh, our author and speaker right now. William Kent Kruger is the New York Times bestselling author of Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land. A native of the Pacific Northwest, Kent makes his home in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, Kent, if you uh, have read any interviews with him or if you happen to be a member of the mystery writing community like I am, we all know that Kent is a disciplined writer who pre-COVID could be found at his neighborhood coffee shops working away at his latest novel. This discipline has been to our advantage. Kruger first made his mark telling his stories about Cork O'Connor, the former sheriff of the fictional Tamarack County, who was part Irish and part Ojibwe. Desolation Mountain was the 17th Cork novel. This summer, readers will be treated to a prequel with Lightning Strike. In 2013, Kent published Ordinary Grace. This Tender Land is the companion novel to Ordinary Grace. And today, Kent is going to talk about the transformative power of stories. Let us please give a warm welcome to William Kent Kruger. Thank you very much, Shelley. Um, I wanna thank you for all of the good hard work you've done and the rest uh, of your, your folks there uh, to bring us all together for an event this evening in support of the Library Foundation. Before I, um, before I launch into my prepared remarks, I wanna tell you a story about libraries because that's really what we're all here about this evening because we all understand the importance of libraries. Um, so here's my library story. When I was 12 years old, that would have been the summer between my uh, sixth and seventh grade year, 
Uh, I was a Boy Scout and I decided that summer to get my reading merit badge. And one of the requirements for the reading merit badge, at least back then, was that you had to spend some time volunteering in your local library. I was living in a little town in Ohio at that point. So I went to the library and I made the arrangements. And when the time came to do my duty, I showed up. Now this was long before they had computerized check-in and check-out. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the days when the, the uh, inside cover of the back of every book had a little pocket in it. And inside that pocket was a, a card for checking in and checking out the books. So what they did was they put me to work date stamping the, re the cards for the returned books. They gave me this little uh, black ink pad and a changeable rubber date stamp. And so for the first hour I was there, it was sort of ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. And after about an hour of that, the, uh, the librarian proceeded to walk my way and ask me a very librarian-esque question. She said to me, Kent, what do you like to read? <laughs> well, yeah, the honest to God truth was I like to read comic books, but I didn't want to tell her that. Uh, and I briefly considered lying to her, but there was that whole, a scout is trustworthy thing going on. So, uh, so I told her the truth. And without batting an eye, she said to me, have you ever read The Count of Monte Cristo? I walked out of the library that day with that great Dumas classic under my arm and I came back about a week later and checked out the Three Musketeers and after that it was the man in the iron mask. Um, and when I'd read everything uh, that our little library had by Dumas, I asked her, what should I read next? And she turned me on to H.G. Wells and Jules Verne and Arthur Conan Doyle and Jack London and, and Robert Louis Stevenson and all of these, these authors who wrote stories that were perfect for capturing a boy's heart and a boy's imagination. I don't know, I don't know uh, how you think of your librarians, but I don't just think of them as those people who keep the books on the shelves in the right order and uh, maybe give us a hard time if we return them late. I think of librarians in a very real way as important guides in our understanding of the world. And I think that's particularly true when we're young and they, and they direct us to the books that help us understand ourselves and our relationship to the world. I think of libraries as the archives of our culture. These are the places that house the books that are so important to our understanding of who we are. These are the books that tell us um, where we came from, uh, who we were. They tell us where we are now. They tell us who we might become and where we might be going. When our libraries are gone and our libraries with them, there goes everything we are as a culture. So I applaud all of you who are supporting the work of the Rochester Library Foundation. It's important work and we all need to be involved in it. All right. So I'm gonna to talk to you this evening about the transformative power of stories because I'm a storyteller and uh, stories are so important to me, but you know, they're important to you as well. They're important to all of us. I'm gonna begin by asking what's gonna seem like a very simple question. Here's my question. How many of you think you know how the Bible begins? Simple question, right? How many of you think you know how the Bible begins? Well, I'm guessing those of you who have an answer probably believe the Bible begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, I have a different take on this. I think the Bible begins before you read that first line. I think the Bible begins even before you crack the cover on that great spiritual text. I think the Bible begins with this seductive whisper that comes to you from that great book itself. And what it whispers to you is this. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Because isn't that what the Bible is after all? A collection of some of the greatest stories ever told. It's the story of the creation. It's the story of Noah and the flood. It's the story of Moses and the Exodus. It's the story of Daniel in the lion's den of, of David and the hot water he gets himself into with God because of Bathsheba. And the New Testament, it's, the, it's that, that wonderful Christmas story, the story of the birth of Jesus. And it's the, the tragic story of, of the betrayal, his betrayal. And it's the, the terrible story of, uh, of the crucifixion, and finally the wonderful story of the resurrection. Story after story after story. And just think for a moment, three of the great religions of the world all draw inspiration from the same Old Testament stories. I'm talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
had a guy uh, shoot me an email not too long ago uh, to, uh, to tell me how much he enjoyed one of my novels, Ordinary Grace. And because Ordinary Grace is about a minister's family, he had a few, this guy had a few things he also wanted to say about sermons. Basically, this is what he said to me. He said, uh, Dear Mr. Kruger, I go to a Unitarian church. We have a wonderful minister there. She tells terrific sermons. But the truth is, when I get home and think about what she said, all I really remember are the stories she told. I don't know about you, but that certainly rings true for me. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to suggest that probably most of us didn't come to an understanding of, uh, of right and wrong, uh, good and evil, as a result of really something we heard from the pulpit. I'm guessing most of us, our first understanding of what it was to do the right thing, came to us as a result of a story that was told to us or read to us when we were quite young and had a profound impact on us. That's certainly true for me. My first, uh, my first um, uh, understanding of what it was to do the right thing came from a story that was read to me when I was five years old and was written by a guy who called himself Dr. Seuss. The story, Horton Hatches the Egg. Um, so for those of you who, uh, who have forgotten the gist of that great moral treatise, it goes like this. It begins with a, a lazy bird named Maisie, who's sitting on an egg in a nest in a tree, waiting for the egg to hatch. Maisie is bored out of her mind. She would rather be anywhere than sitting on that egg waiting for it to hatch. And along comes um, Horton, who is really a good-hearted elephant. And, uh, and Maisie convinces Horton to take a little time on the nest for her while she takes a break. So Horton settles his huge bulk atop that fragile little egg in the nest. And just before Maisie leaves, he promises her that he will absolutely be there when she comes back. But Maisie has no intention of ever coming back. So there Horton sits, night and day and all kinds of weather. The other animals of the forest make fun of him. Um, one day, uh, some hunters show up. And they are so amazed to see this huge elephant atop this fragile little egg that instead of shooting Horton, they capture him. And they take him and the nest and the egg and the tree and they cart them across the ocean and they sell Horton to a circus as a sideshow exhibit. And through all of this, these terrible events, Horton has held to this little mantra which he repeats to himself, I meant what I said and I said what I meant, an elephant's faithful, 100%. So one day, Maisie's out there flying around, and she spots, she spots Horton down there. So she circles down to him, and just about the time she gets to him, the egg hatches. And out comes not a Maisie bird, but a beautiful little elephant bird that looks exactly like Horton. And at the end of the story, Horton and his little hatchling head off together, and Horton is happy 100%. Faithfulness the importance of keeping the promises that we make. I learned that at five from an elephant named Horton. And of course, after that, I had to read uh, Horton Hears a Who, uh, from which I learned a person's a person, no matter how small. <laughs> which has yeah, always seemed to me a, a philosophy that if we really lived it would make the world such a better place. Um, I learned a lot about what it was to be a good elephant from Horton, but also what it was to be a good human being. Uh, you know, you've seen people out there with the, this bumper sticker on the car, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I have a bumper sticker on my car, WWHD, what would Horton do? Jesus, Jesus understood the power of stories. How did Jesus teach? He taught in parables, simple stories with profound eternal truths at the heart of them. Uh, depending upon how you characterize a parable, most scholars agree that there are more than 30 parables recounted across the four Gospels of the New Testament. Um, you know, we, we know many of them, probably most of them. The parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the Good Samaritan. My own favorite story is the parable of the prodigal son. Um, now, for those of you who were asleep when that lesson was being taught in church, it goes like this. Uh, a, a rich landowner decides he's going to sell some of his land and, uh, and divide the profits with it between his two sons. Now, one son takes the money his father has given him and he puts it away and he stays in his community and continues to the work his family and his father and his community expect of him. Now, the other son takes his money and he goes off uh, far away and, uh, and lives a very dissolute life. So much so 
that eventually he finds himself deeply in debt. And he's preparing to sell himself into slavery to pay off that debt when he decides instead he's going to go back home and prostrate himself before his father and beg forgiveness. Now, long before he reaches home, his father, his father gets word of his homecoming, and he orders a huge feast prepared in honor of his returning son. Now, the son who stayed back and did what the, his father and the community expected uh, of him is miffed. Uh, he says to his father, you know, I, I did the right thing, and you never, you never prepared a feast like this in my honor. And the father assures his son that he loves them both equally. And what they're celebrating here is the fact that a son who has been lost is found again. I love that story. I love that story as a storyteller, particularly because it can be seen as a story told from many different perspectives. It can be seen as the father's story. You know, what parent among us hasn't had a child go off into the world and do such stupid things we couldn't believe it, and then rejoice when, when our children come to their senses, right? Um, or it can be seen as the, as the story of the, uh, the, the, the brother who stays back and he does what his, his community expected of him and he feels like he's not getting a, a enough recognition for that. Or it can be seen as the, as the story of the son who goes off and screws up and in the end all he wants is to be embraced by his father and forgiven. Or it can be seen as this interesting family dynamic. But there's another reason I love this parable and that's because in my family we have our own parable of the prodigal son, although in our family it's the parable of the prodigal daughter. My sister married a sociopath. I mean, this guy was certifiably nuts. We all knew it, and she admitted that she knew it too, but she went ahead and, and married the guy anyway. And after that, things pretty much progressed, as you might expect. Uh, he was unfaithful to her. He lied about it. Uh, they separated. They got back together, but in the end, they, they, they divorced which left my sister living in California all alone, trying to raise a one-year-old daughter. Now, my wife and I and our children were living here in St. Paul because my wife was going to the University of, of uh, Minnesota Law School, and we were sharing a house with my parents who were helping us while my, my wife was doing that. When my father got word of my sister's situation, he called a family council, and we all sat down, and he said, I think we should invite your sister to come and, and live with us. Now, my response to that proposition was not my finest hour. I really reacted like the son who'd done what was expected of him. I said, you know, she understood what she was getting herself into. She made her bed. I think we should, I think she, we should let her sleep in it. My father counseled um, unconditional love and forgiveness. And in the end, my father's wife, wise counsel prevailed, and my sister did come and join us in, in that large extended household. You know, I never really understood the wisdom of my father until my children grew up and went out and screwed up in their own ways, and I understood the importance of, of forgiveness. We tend to think of stories primarily as entertainment. But clearly stories can do so much more for us. Stories can enlighten us, but they can do even more. Stories can encourage us. I don't know how many of you know the story of Robert the Bruce uh, and the persistent little spider, but it's a story my father told me when I was really young and I've never forgotten it. If you don't know the story, it goes like this. Robert the Bruce ascended to the, uh, to the Scottish throne in something like 1306. And this was in a time when Scotland was still under, under the tyrannical thumb of English rule. And they'd been trying forever to, uh, to get themselves freed from that. Um, if you remember the movie Braveheart, uh, it's the story of William Wallace who fought for Scottish independence. And if you ever saw the movie, you know how that turned out for William Wallace. Well, when Wallace fails, Robert the Bruce takes up the battle for independence and twice he leads his army on the field against the English and twice he's defeated. And after that second defeat, he takes to the hills with the English uh, hot on his trail. Um, and one night when he's, when he's running, so the story goes, Robert the Bruce takes uh, shelter in an abandoned cottage in the Scottish Highlands. And while he's there in the cottage licking his wounds and, and resting up and trying to figure out what the hell he's going to do next, he happens to look up into the rafters above him and he sees a spider attempting to, to spin a web. 
Um, what the spider's doing is trying to cast a thread from one rafter to the next in order to form the foundation for the web it wants to spin. And six times that spider casts its web and six times the spider fails. But on the seventh cast, the spider succeeds and begins to spin a beautiful web. And Robert the Bruce, so the story goes, taking encouragement from what he's seen that little spider do, decides he's going to lead his army against this, the English one more time. So one more time, he leads his army onto the field against the English, and this time he wins. He frees Scotland. It's a great story. Is it true? Who the hell cares? It's a great story with an important point at the heart of it. So stories don't just entertain us, they enlighten us, they encourage us. But you know what else they do? They inspire us. I'm gonna tell you um, a story here about a piece of fiction that gave me inspiration. Inspiration in the end gone terribly awry. So when I was uh, in the fifth grade, um, I was living on a farm out in, the, in, in Ohio. And, uh, and that year, toward the end of the year, our teacher read to the class, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. I love that book, because here was this kid. He was just like me. He was out there on the Mississippi River having all of these adventures. And so when the, the school year was over, um, I pitched the idea to, to a couple of friends of ours. You know, I was living on a farm and this creek called Riley Creek ran through our farm. And on the other side of the creek uh, lived a family called the Gratz family. And the Gratz had two sons. Uh, the older son was my older brother's age and the younger son was my age. So when school's over, I pitched to the Gratz boys and my brother the idea that we should build a raft and set sail on Riley Creek. Now, two miles down, uh, down the creek, it ran through the little town where we all went to school, and a couple miles beyond that, it emptied into a large river that, if we followed it, would take us all the way to Lake Erie. It was a grand scheme, and they bought it. So, uh, we spent a few days gathering up uh, scrap wood and, uh, and uh, lashing it together and nailing it together, and we had our little creation uh, all assembled. We carried it down to Riley Creek, and we put it in the water beneath a bridge that spanned the creek, and we hung a rope down from that bridge so we could get down to the raft, and then we drew straws to see who was going to test our little creation. My brother drew the long straw. So he took off his kids, and he rolled up his, uh, his uh, pant legs, grabbed hold of the rope, and he climbed down to the raft. Now, holding tightly to that rope, he put out one bare foot to test the stability of the raft. It held. Still holding to the rope, he put out the other bare foot. The raft held. Finally, he decided it was time uh, to, to give it the litmus test, and he let go of the, the rope. And immediately, the raft disappeared beneath the, the brown water of Riley Creek. And before it went under, it tipped and it threw my brother. And he disappeared beneath the brown water of Riley Creek, which really wasn't too terrible because Riley Creek was like two and a half feet deep there. And, and he came up all covered with mud and, and gook. And that was pretty much the end of our grand expedition. But I've taken two things away from that experience. One was this, the understanding that no matter how how hard I would imagine it or how much I might want it, Riley Creek was never going to be uh, the Mississippi River or any kind of a river. And the other was this. The image I have carried across my entire life of the biggest, blackest leech I have ever seen that attached itself to my brother's bare foot. It's the only time I've ever heard him scream like a, like a baby. <laughs> and I still never let him forget it. So stories entertain us and they encourage us and they inspire us. But you know, the most important thing that I think stories do, they give us hope. I want to tell you a story that I've always thought of as a hopeful story. Um, I cut my teeth on mysteries. The... I love saying this, New York Times, best-selling Cork O'Connor mystery series. Um, but about 11 years ago, a story idea came to me that wasn't a Cork O'Connor story. And when I proposed the project to my publisher, they didn't want it. In fact, they called me out to New York City in kind of a panic and set me down and said, Kent, we only want Cork O'Connor stories from you. 
So I knew um, if I wrote the story, it was going to be a risky proposition, but it spoke to me in such a compelling way, I knew I had to write it. So across the course of the next three years, I composed the manuscript for a story called Ordinary Grace. Now, even though my publisher had told me they didn't want it, um, when I finished it, I went ahead and sent it to my editor at Simon & Schuster. She fell in love with it. She said, of course, we're going to publish it, and they did. Uh, and Ordinary Grace has had this this really remarkable, really gratifying reception from critics and readers alike. It won tons of awards when it came out. It's been translated into more than two dozen foreign languages. So far, it's sold nearly a million copies. Now, when my publisher saw how well that book was doing, uh, boy, did they want another book just like it. So I signed a contract for a companion novel. They paid me um, an exorbitant advance. And I spent the next few years writing what I believe would be the companion novel to Ordinary Grace. Now, that manuscript was contractually due to my publisher more than five years ago. Two months before that contractual deadline, I set up a meeting in Chicago to talk to my agent about revisions to the piece because there were problems with it. I knew it, she knew it. Two days before we got together, I sent her a note saying, when we meet, I don't wanna talk about how we revise this piece. I wanna talk about how we keep it from being published because it wasn't the story I'd imagined it would be. I didn't know how to make it that story. And frankly, my heart wasn't in it. Um, my publisher turned out to be quite understanding. They said, fine, you don't have to give us this manuscript, but you still owe us a companion novel. So here's the deal. The expectations for that follow-up novel were enormous. And the whole time I was trying to write the story, I felt crushed by the weight of all those expectations. And the truth is what I was doing when I was writing the manuscript was trying to meet everybody else's expectations instead of writing the story that spoke to me from my heart. But as soon as I got all that weight off my shoulders and I felt free again, I saw so clearly the story I should have been writing, the story that did speak to me from my heart. And that story became a novel called This Tender Land. This Tender Land spent, more, spent almost six months on the New York Times bestseller list. Stories have been an important part of who we are as human beings ever since we first learned how to communicate with one another. Across countless millennia, stories have entertained us and enlightened us and encouraged us and inspired us and given us hope. I have come to believe that stories are every bit as important to us as breathing. And I have to tell you that as a storyteller, I have come to believe profoundly that the most seductive, most promising, maybe even most important words any of us are ever going to hear are these. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Thanks very much for listening, folks. Okay, I think we're gonna to get to some questions here. Absolutely, well, first and foremost, thank you. Um, and, and what's funny is, um, and, and trust me, friends who are in the audience, I have a million questions, so start getting them in the chat. Otherwise I will talk uh, Mr. Kruger's ear <laughs> off and y'all be, will be sad because it's gonna be everything I wanna ask him. But um, so we haven't had a lot of questions, but I have to read the comments to you. Um, Grace, uh, the woman we introduced you to earlier who knows everybody, what a lovely sermon. You are welcome to come teach my confirmation class anytime. <laughs> and and I, 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 I feel that, I feel that. Um, you know, you had talked about, uh, you know, this tender land, it was that leap of faith and then, you know, went on to spend those six months, you know, on the New York Times bestseller list and uh, John and Sandy, and it is terrific. Um, uh, Dudley, I have read many of Mr. Kruger's books and have always felt like I was there, almost like a fly on the wall, and I have enjoyed every one of them. And yes, that has been, I think, one of the gifts. Um, like, when when I first started reading the Kirk O'Connor books, it was just like, my gosh, does he listen to my uncles when they're together in their hunting cabin? Because... <laughs> it's it's weird you could get along with my family fantastically um and then just you know uh lots of people just loving the quirk series and again uh your your uh companion novels uh Erlene, i totally agree my grandkids always want me to make up the story and remember it the next time i see them i think stories are so important for our kids and for our grandchildren i mean when you think about that tradition of storytelling it is so woven in our culture and um 
and I hope we never lose it. Um, so, and, and now, yay, good, thank you, everyone. Get your questions in the chat. Before I, I start reading those out loud, one thing I wanted to ask you when I was researching for this session, um, I love your words. I loved your music uh, uh, recommendations, the, the, the playlist companion to this tender land. Can you tell me a little bit about like, is that music that like you like found as an undergraduate or how did that, how did you find that? And then for people who don't know what I'm talking about, if you go to Mr. Kruger's website, there is a playlist of the music that I think you kind of thought of when you were working on this Tenderland and it's just incredible. So if you would tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. But before I do that, I just want to say the, uh, the uh, foundation events here are called Wit, Wisdom and Wine. Is that not correct? I don't know about the wit and the wisdom part, but I certainly have the wine. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, friends. See, see Kent, I told you you'd fit right in. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah, for those people who uh, who don't know what uh, Shelley is talking about here, uh, you haven't read uh, my most recent novel, This Tender Land. This ten the narrator of This Tender Land is a 13-year-old boy who happens to be a harmonica player. And um, and he and uh, three of his, uh, his companions, young companions, take an epic journey in the summer of 1932. And they have all kinds of obstacles and challenges. And sometimes their spirits are a little low. And, uh, and what my protagonist, my uh, narrator, his name is Odio Banyan, what he does to keep their spirits up is play the harmonica. He entertains them with music. And Shelley, I knew when I was thinking about this story, that was one of the ways Odie was gonna keep spirits up because music is so elemental to who we are as human beings. You know, We fall in love to music, we get married to music, we get buried to music, we march away to war to music. What would a movie be without a musical score, right? So <clears throat> when I thought logically about what kind of an instrument uh, this musician would take with him on a trip, well, harmonica um, seemed like the most reasonable thing and so American, so American. Uh, so I had Odie play uh, a lot of the tunes that were favorites of mine when I was a kid, you know, great American ballads, particularly Shenandoah, which was a huge favorite tune of mine when I was growing up as a kid. Yeah, but old Joel Clark and, you know, on and on. And then I did some research about the tunes that Odie could have played back in the summer of 1932 when he makes his, his journey. Um, so I was looking at uh, Cole Porter tunes and uh, Gershwin tunes that, that Odie would be aware of, would have been out then, Odie would be aware of. And then my, uh, so those are all part uh, of the fabric of the story. Uh, and then my agent, when we were putting together the website for it and all said, you know, I'm going to make a Spotify list. So she and her husband, who are great lovers of music, scoured the internet for authentic versions of these tunes. They would have sounded uh, very familiar to, to Odie. So that's where all of that came from. It's just such a delight. Oh, it was so much fun. Well, so now um, I'm gonna dive into the chat here, but before I do that now, so Odie is your 13 year old protagonist in this tender land. Speaking of 13 year olds, um, your next book is a prequel to your co Cork O'Connor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, the novel is called Lightning Strike. It will be released in August, this coming August. And as Shelley indicated, it's a prequel to the Cork O'Connor series. Uh, for anyone who, under, who knows my Cork O'Connor series, you may remember that Cork was sheriff of Tamarack County at one point. And when he was a kid, his father was also sheriff of Tamarack County. And his father was killed in the line of duty uh, when Cork was 13 years old. Um, and so what Lightning Strike does is it takes a look at Cork in the summer before his father is killed. And what it allowed me to do was explore that important relationship that Cork had with his father, the relationship Cork had with his mother, the relationship his parents had with each other, these important relationships that shaped Cork into the man he is uh, at the heart of the series. For those of you who, uh, who read my series, you know that one of my favorite characters and readers' favorite characters is... Um, um, Henry Malou, the Ojibwe Mide. Um, and in the series as I'm writing it currently, Henry Malou is 105 years old. In Lightning Strike, he's a spry 65 year old guy. <laughs> so, I just had a delightful time writing this particular story. 
Well, in, uh, Joanne asks, what has been the inspiration for your Co Cork O'Connor books? And does an event trigger an idea or does the story evolve as you are writing it? Typically, very often, I won't say typically, but very often the Cork O'Connor stories revolve around uh, an important social issue that, uh, that affects uh, very often the Ojibwe community. So I've written about um, Indian gaming casinos and the effect that that's had both on the native community and the surrounding white community. I've written about, well, the ongoing battle we have here in Minnesota over hunting and fishing uh, tree rights. Um, I've written about the influx of the drug and the gang cultures on the reservation. I've written about the, well, the really tragic situation that exists here in, uh, in the Twin Cities and in Duluth and in other large cities that have a significant native population that involves the sexual trafficking of vulnerable native women and children. So very often there is an issue that spurs the story. And I try to create a, a compelling narrative around that um, so that I can enlighten readers about that particular issue. Um, yeah, I, have, I have to admit, um, one of the things I love about mysteries is, is that I can talk about a social issue that's important to me. And, uh, and as long as I have couched it within the context of a good compelling mystery, even readers who don't necessarily agree with my point of view, I have to admit I'm an unrepentant bleeding heart liberal and often my sensibilities find their way into the stories. But even people who don't necessarily agree with my point of view will still read me. And I gotta say this, how often is it that you have a chance to stand up on a soapbox and spout off without giving the other side an opportunity for rebuttal? I love that about what I do. So very often the story does, the story idea does come from an issue, uh, but sometimes it comes from, uh, from an, uh, a different place altogether. I've written a couple of stories based on stories other people told me that came out of their family experiences. So, you know, a story can come from almost anywhere. Absolutely. Now, and, and people, uh, friends, know that um, I, I see your questions, I'm writing them down, but I am kind of taking them in an order that feels like it promotes good conversation. So um, you mentioned uh, your character, Harry, and uh, one thing that has always struck me reading the Quirk books, and Kim Jensen also noted this, um, you do capture the Ojibwe culture fantastically well. How do you research this culture? Uh, well, I, I assume that these, that you, I know you're white, and I, I'm assuming the people, the person who made the comment is probably white. If you were to ask this of uh, a, an Ojibwe reader, you might get a different reaction. Uh, but here's, here's where all of that came from. When I decided that I was going to include the Ojibwe as an element of my Cork O'Connor series, um, I knew nothing about them which is basically what every white person knows about the native cultures that we live shoulder to shoulder with here in Minnesota. But I was uh, a cultural anthropology major in college. And so the idea of learning about this culture, not my own, was a pretty exciting prospect. And I began uh, in the way all good academics began. I began by reading. Um, and, uh, and in the course of my research, I began to meet and uh, members of the Ojibwe community and form relationships that have over time become important friendships uh, for me. I am always painfully aware that I'm a right guy, a white guy trespassing on a culture not my own. So I do my very best uh, to get it right. And uh, before I turn in a manuscript to my publisher, I usually have at least one, usually two of my Ojibwe friends read and vet the manuscript for me. So I haven't said anything that's too stupid or even worse offensive. Um, so that's really where all that comes from. And you know, I have to tell you this, I've been working with the Ojibwe community for more than two decades and I have come to have such a great admiration and a great respect for the culture, its, its richness, it's, it's an ancient culture, it's complex. And when I think about the fact that, um, you know, our ancestors did their best to eradicate the indigenous people from this continent. And I think yet here they are and they haven't lost their sense of humor. I just think these people are, are marvelous. They are just tremendous. So you, you mentioned, you know, cultural anthropology, uh, you know, there's this almost academic part of writing. Uh, one of our uh, audience members asked, were you good at writing papers and essays in high school? Yeah, yeah, I was what? really good. In fact, 
I remember in college, uh, whenever I would get it, I, you know, essays, essays were fine, but there was always uh, too much of a structure to an essay. And uh, I've always been a storyteller. Uh, and so I like working outside <laughs> a, a set structure. And so I have to tell you this, I, I kind of skated my way through uh, many of my college courses by instead of writing a paper, I would create a story or a play or something that got to the heart of whatever it was we were supposed to be talking about. And the response from my professors who read dry paper after dry paper after dry paper was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I bet they welcomed it. <laughs> Absolutely, they Change did. Change of pace. Well, so another uh, person asked the question, and this goes back to that earlier comment about how, you know, when reading, you know, your stories, we feel like, you know, we're in the room with your characters. Um, is there going to be a movie of this tender land? And you know, don't limit the the answer to this tender land if there are any of your books or that are under any kind of like a creative option, we'd love to hear about it. Sure, we've been, uh, we've been working in negotiations with three different production companies for the rights to this tender land. We haven't settled on anything yet. Um, and I've been working with Hollywood for more than 20 years now. Uh, and the, the one thing I know about Hollywood is, is that everything in Hollywood moves at two speeds, slow and glacial. So don't hold your breath. Um, Ordinary Grace uh, has been uh, optioned for the film and there is currently a screenplay being written for that. Um, and I met a little over a month ago with a Hollywood producer who's interested in uh, bringing my Cork O'Connor series to television, one of the plat television platforms as a series. Uh, but again, don't hold your breath. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Well, and I know um, you are on uh, one of the, the last slides that I'll show as part of this is uh, your various sh social media handles. And I know on uh, Twitter, I have seen different book recommendations that you have made. Um, and uh, one of our uh, audience members did ask, what are you reading now? And I would like to uh, append to that question by asking, what are some exciting books that you read during 2020. I don't know about you, but I actually got a lot of reading done, <laughs> so. So uh, a great deal of my reading uh, in 2021 or 2020, and really all of the time involves, involves what are called ARCs, Advanced Readers, Copies, mm -hmm. or Galleys. These are books that won't be on the shelves for many months or maybe even over a year, depending upon what happens with the pandemic. Um, but I've been asked to read them with an eye to offering what in the business is called a blurb, a dust jacket quote. You know, you've seen that, that thing on the cover of books that says, Stephen King says, this is the best thing since the Bible. Um, when I broke into the business, established writers were willing to give me dust jacket quotes. And so uh, those of us with any social conscience pays, pay it back by reading those, uh, those manuscripts or, or ARCs or galleys from writers who are now breaking in. So I'm reading a lot of those. But I'm also, I've also been reading, uh, I've been in conversations with a number of other authors uh, because we are now promoting our books in different ways. We're doing this as opposed to the long arduous tours across the country that we used to do. So a month ago, I believe I did, a, I was in conversation with a woman, an author named uh, Lisa Wingate, uh, mm -hmm. whose novel Before We Were Yours is very, very similar in many respects to this tender land. It takes place during the Great Depression. It's about children uh, uh, battling enormous obstacles. In her case, it was about, it was based on a true event, true situation. Uh, and I love that book, Before We Were Yours. I'm going to be in conversation in about two weeks with another author, Kristen Hanna. You may remember her, mm -hmm. her, uh, her novel, The Nightingale, was just an enormous, enormous phenomenon. And she has a new book coming out called The Four Winds. It'll be out in February. And I'll be in conversation with her in February talking about The Four Winds. And this book is just blowing me away. Like uh, This Tender Land, it's set during the Great Depression. Hers is set, um, begins in the Dust Bowl area of uh, the south of the south, Texas, actually, and follows a family battling to survive during the Great uh, Depression and the Dust Bowl. It's just a phenomenal piece of storytelling. 
So those are my two big recommendations at the moment. Fantastic. Uh, Kathy, uh, one of our uh, audience members asked, have you read Braiding Sweetgrass? Um, I have not. It's one of my wife's favorite books. It is on my to be read stack next to my bed. And I can't tell you the number who, of people who have recommended braiding sweetgrass to me. I am eager to get to it, but I have so many other obligations in my reading these days. You know, it's so funny. Every time I get on a on a event like this, my my TBR list just grows I know. exponentially. I know exactly which, what you mean. Which is wonderful. Now, um, <laughs> one uh, another question. Um, yeah, or, uh, not, or actually, this is, this is a question I came up with. Um, Maxine uh, mentioned that her book club is about to start reading Ordinary Grace. And you kind of mentioned, you know, how the pandemic and, um, you know, book tours as authors know what has changed, you know, just drastically. There are so many virtual events, et cetera. Um, I mean, do you do a lot of book clubs or I mean, what's, tell us a little bit how things have changed with the pandemic. Um, you know, from that promotional standpoint, but also with your writing, how how are you? How are you coping? By the end of January, Shelley, I will have zoomed with more than 180 book groups or book related events since last April. Uh, this is how we are all uh, connecting with our readership these days. And I got to tell you, I will never go back to those long, arduous cross-country book tours again. I so love, I'm in my basement, you know? I'm drinking a glass of wine. I'm having a wonderful time. And I don't have to leave the house. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm, I am guessing that most publishers are not going to underwrite tours in the way they used to, because this is a wonderful way to connect with an audience. Um, I've connected with audiences internationally this way. Um, so, you know, I don't have to fly to Israel to, <laughs> to do this. I can do this via Zoom quite easily. So, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love connecting with audiences this way. And, you know, look at, look at the discussion you and I are having right here. You know, we might be in the same room. You know, it's, it's that level. That level of intimacy, I think, still exists. Well, and, and that's something we've been talking about, um, you, you know, a little behind the scenes uh, with uh, this whole Lit Wisdom and Wine. You know, for those of us, you know, we have had so many wonderful speakers over the years um, that, that there's no question about that. But the coordination that does go on in the front of it, you know, emailing and doing the Zoom tests, I feel like I, you know, I, I was joking with the ladies earlier. I, I feel like we can take the bookmobile to uh, Sonoma and go see Rob at Val Raven. So, I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, it, as much as technology sometimes makes me feel like, you know, we're losing some sort of that intimacy and some sort of that contact at the same time, though, it's just like, this is fantastic. And actually, you know, you bring up a really good question that Brenda had. What are you drinking, Kent? What kind of wine are you sipping tonight? We want to know because this is wit, wisdom, and wine. This is a Pinot Noir called Miomi. It's out of Oregon, and it's it's my wife and and uh, my favorite um, favorite red wine right now. We'll have to we'll have to talk to Tessa and see if they have that down at Tessa's office. She's been the she is the local uh, shop that we partner with for the spirits and the wines that we've been uh, that we've been consuming okay. during this event. So and it turns out it looks like Brenda has some. Well, of I got to so tell you this, Mike. My... Oh, good, good. But I got to tell you this: my agent every year um, for Christmas sends me a collection of wines. She's a wine expert. And she has always toured, you know, Sonoma, Napa. And every year she sends me a dozen bottles of, of wines that she has hand chosen herself. And um, we, just, we just finished the last of those, I think, last week. And um, God, I love good wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. I will send you the list that we got from Bell Raven. Oh, it was wonderful! Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. And the and cheese. Was very and the cheeses. Yeah. Oh, those cheeses were fantastic. Yes, we, we we can do that. We can do that. I'm just making sure. Hey, Catherine, are there any questions that I have missed? 
I see Maxine dropped in a comment. I hope the library can continue to offer more talks like this in the winter. This has been especially nice. We agree because it's fantastic to, you know, be able to have this conversation and not have to drive. And what, I think we're supposed to get snow tonight. So this is fantastic. Did I miss anything, Catherine? Or am I go? Oh, hang on. Oh, I have them all. Folks, we still have a few minutes left. If there are any questions, um, I, I'm not I just, at a loss. Can I just go ahead. Here. Yes. I want to put in a pitch for independent bookstores. I know it's really easy for you to buy your books on Amazon. It's just a click away. But here's, here's the story, folks. When I was growing up, and I'm sure this is true for you, Every town I lived in had a bookstore. And when I moved to the city, every neighborhood in that city had a bookstore. And then borders came along and we lost some of those bookstores. And then uh, Barnes and Noble came along and we lost more of those bookstores. And then that monster called Amazon reared its ugly, ugly head and we lost even more. The borders is gone. And Barnes and Noble has been on the ropes for a while. And if Barnes and Noble drops out of the game, who's left? You have Amazon, that faceless entity for whom books are nothing but units to be moved. And you have your local independent bookseller who is in the business because he or she understands the importance and the power of the written word. I don't know about you, but I know whose voices I want in this game when decisions are being made about the books that are gonna be available for us all to read. So please, 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 if you're going to buy a book, contact your local independent bookseller. They're, they're almost as easy as Amazon and, it's, and your heart will feel so good when you've done it that way. Oh, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, that's I agree. And Nancy Brubaker, there's nothing like browsing in a bookstore. I miss that so much. I, uh, um, there is nothing like it in the world. Um, Victoria asks, do you have any advice for aspiring writers? I have two pieces of advice for aspiring writers. First of all, it's this, write every day, write every day, seven days a week. Find some time. It doesn't have to be a lot of time. It can be 30 minutes, 40. You can do a lot of damage in 30 or 45 minutes as a writer, believe me. But write every day. What it does is, is that it's, it will give you the discipline that I think is necessary to every artist. I don't care what your medium is. If you're an artist and you want to accomplish anything, you have to approach it in a disciplined way. So write every day. That's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is this. If you're going to be a writer, you probably will not have a career. So if you're going to be a writer, the best piece of advice I can offer you is this. Marry someone with a good job. That's good advice. Now, another, so now speaking about that discipline, um, as, I, as I hinted at uh, during my introduction, um, you know, the story of you uh, taking your morning at the St. Clair broiler is legend, and it is. Um, Susan Shepard asks, tell us about your writing process um, at the broiler. Um, again, I know unfortunately that's closed now, but how did you get enough privacy to work and finish your books? Privacy? Who needs privacy? <laughs> that's one of the things I love about coffee shops. They're noisy places. So here's, here's how my relationship with the broiler began. Uh, we moved to the Twin Cities so my wife could go to the University of Minnesota Law School. And I suddenly became the guy who, uh, who was the sole support of the family. Had to keep the roof over, had food on the table, but I wanted desperately to be a writer. So if I was going to meet my responsibilities and still develop as a writer, I had to come up with a way to do that. We were living two blocks from the St. Clair Broiler here in St. Paul, an iconic cafe. And the broiler opened its doors at six o'clock every morning, seven days a week. So I pitched this idea to my wife. I said, Diane, if you're willing to get the kids up first thing, get them dressed and fed and off to school so I can go right. Um, I swear to you, when I come home from my job at the end of the day, I will be the best husband, the best father you can possibly imagine. She bought it. So there I was at six o'clock every morning at the broiler with my pen and notebook in hand because this was long before we had laptops. They, uh, they opened the doors for me. I sat in booth number four, always booth number four. They saved it for me. 
Um, they would pour me my coffee. I would open my notebook, and from 6 until 7.15, I would write. At 7.15, I closed my notebook, paid for my coffee, and I went out front where at 7.20, a bus would pick me up and take me to the university where I was working. I did that day in and day out for decades, at the broiler for decades. Um, and, uh, and so writing in a coffee shop became part of the magic of my creation. Um, I am so used to writing in noise, that noisy environment that it's, it's difficult for me to write at home because it's too quiet. I have actually had this experience. I've been writing on a day at home when I had the house to myself. I can remember this day. It was winter. Uh, the sun was out. The snow was out there. The sunlight was glistening. It's quiet in the house. It's exactly the kind of environment that you would think would be conducive to creative work. And what am I doing? I'm sitting there going, hmm, shouldn't the furnace have come on by now? You know, I hear everything. The, I walk by the kitchen sink and the dishes there are crying out to be washed. The, somebody knocks at the door. I've got to answer it. The phone rings, you know. But if I'm in a coffee shop, all of that noise has nothing to do with me. The waitress drops a tray of dishes, big deal. It's not my responsibility. It's this white noise. And I'm, I have found a way to sink myself deeply um, into the imagining of my story while all of that noise is going on around me. The hard part, since we have to shelter at home now, is having to adjust to, to writing at home rather than the coffee shop. And it's just really quiet. So I still get up at six o'clock every morning and I go to the coffee, well, instead of going to the coffee shop. I have exchanged my kitchen counter for the coffee shop, um, but I still write for two or three hours every day. I'm married to the world's most wonderful woman. She has promised to stay in bed every morning until I finish my writing. So that's how that's going these days. So how um, one of our reader or one of one of our readers loves reading eBooks and how does, how does that affect authors? Uh, is that is, um, I mean, yeah, I'll just leave that. How, do, how does that affect authors? Do you know, I think it, it affects booksellers more than it affects authors. You know, as an author, I don't care how you come to my work. I just want you to read my stories. If you read them as an ebook, that's just fine. If you buy the book, that's just fine. If you read it, if you get it out of the library, that's just fine. If you listen to it as an audio, that's just fine. Um, the truth about ebooks is, is that uh, there are some advantages uh, to an ebook as an author. Uh, when someone hears your name, they can click on the internet, buy your book really quickly as an impulse buy, whether they read you or not. Um, as a result of the technology today, many books that were out of print are back and available as eBooks now. So there, there's lots to recommend eBooks. Um, but you know, for, for booksellers, that can be problematic because it does take away the revenue from, uh, from booksellers who buy primarily or sell primarily the, the real thing. You can buy eBooks via independent booksellers um, using, I think, the Kobo, I think is the reader they use. And most um, uh, most bookstores, independent bookstores, when you go to their website, you'll see that as an option. So affects me, not at all, uh, but booksellers, I think it has uh, taken a hit from their sales a bit. Um, so I kind of a good question following that, you know, what what is your favorite bookstore? Oh, I'm not going to go there. There are so many wonderful <laughs> independents in the Twin Cities. If, if I yeah. name one, oh, I will say this, because I am a writer of mysteries, primarily. Um, Once Upon a Crime, which is a fine mystery bookstore in Minneapolis, generally hosts the launch uh, for uh, many of the mystery writers here. Most of us do launch our, do our inaugural uh, event at Once Upon a Crime. So I love Once Upon a Crime. Uh, is it my favorite? I am not going to say that because I love so many of the other independents. When I have a new book out, I try to drop into and do events at as many of the independents here in the Twin Cities as I possibly can. I have really good relationships with them all. Um, it, yeah, we have, you know, uh, just north of us, I know in Northfield, there's Content Books. Oh, a um, lovely Redley. book. Oh, love there's that so store. many wonderful. And, and then, you know, I, and I, again, I know you go all around, you know, Tattered Cover, Denver, Poison Pen. I, I, I do love me a good uh, independent bookstore. Um, do you read your books for, oh, that's a great question, Joanne. So when your stories are made into, so do you read your books for eBooks? And if not, why not? 
I think probably you for mean, audio, for the yeah, audio, the audio books. Yeah, you know, I auditioned once and they turned me down. <laughs> um, there, there's a reason why you have professional readers. Um, imagine how difficult it would be for a normal person to create a unique voice for every character in a story, in a novel, and maintain that unique voice across the whole course of the work. Well, that's a form of genius as far as I'm concerned. Um, do, I, do I listen to the audios of my own books? No, because they don't read them the way I would. <laughs> oh, I hear that. Um, let's see. We had a couple, a couple more questions, and then I think we're going to wrap things up. Oh, uh, Grace, what? So, who are your favorite storytellers? Do you know I have so many uh, favorite st storytellers, uh, storytellers who have influenced me. Um, when I was, my father was a high school English teacher. When I was 18 years old, he insisted I read Ernest Hemingway, and I fell madly in love with Hemingway. So I tried for way too long to write the great American novel as Hemingway might have written it. I don't try to write like Hemingway anymore, uh, but he was certainly influential in my desire to be a writer. Um, I probably am, have been more influenced by John Steinbeck. Um, I love his ability to create um, really sympathetic characters from those people in our society who we tend to overlook or look down on. Uh, think about the Joad family in uh, Grapes of Wrath, or think about the characters in, of Mice and Men. Um, you know, Cormac McCarthy uh, is a writer whose prose I admire enormously, although when I'm reading a Cormac McCarthy novel, I have no idea what the hell is going on. I just love how beautifully he puts words together. Um, so those are some of my faves. That's fantastic. Well, Kent, thank you so much. Um, so when we got this set up, um, Kent graciously gave us a hard cover of This Tender Land that he has signed. And I do have, uh, everybody knows that I'm terrible at technology, Kent. So I have, I have a bowl with names because I'm classy. All right, let's see who, let's see. don't need to be present to win, but Jean Abels. So we will get a hold of you and get this mailed to you. And again, Kent, thank you so much for your kindness and generosity and being with us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen quick to show, um, uh, do do share. Yay. All right. Um, as we've noticed in conversation, uh, Kent is on uh, online. He has his website. That's where that Spotify list of the music that's a great companion with this Tenderland. That is where you can find that. Uh, Kent is on Instagram, uh, William Kent Kruger, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, everybody, thank you so much for attending. Um, this has been a fantastic evening. Um, and uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoy the program. Very intimate. Thank you. This was fantastic. Um, we do have one more uh, experience uh, wine tasting session tonight, so I think we'll see some of you there. Otherwise, again, thank you so much for uh, you know continuing to support our library. Uh, the next slide that I'm going to show, if I can find it, er there we go. To learn more about the foundation or donate to our programs, the links are right there. And also, we do have that Valentine's auction that is going to close tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., correct, Brenda? Okay, I got it right this time. So go uh, go forth, uh, check out our programming. And again, that uh, auction is gonna be running until tomorrow morning. So thank you guys very much. Let's see if I can stop sharing my screen. All right, here we go. Kent, thank you so much. Oh, that was fun. That was so much fun, Shelly. Thanks everybody for all your hard work. Thank you. Oh, this, this has been so, like, again, it's just been so much, so much fun. Well, you do great work and it's important work. So stay with it. Thank you. Oh. Well, it was, it was really cool. I'm Sorry. gonna go have another glass of wine and some dinner. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you. have a great bottom. night, Kat. Thank you. <laughs> Jelly? Oh, hi, everybody. This is my mother-in-law. Hey, Gloria. Was that the cat's dish?
<laughs> it was not the cat's dish. <laughs> That would have been funny if it was, though, but no, that's not the cat's dish. 